Uh, we're back. This is number seven video review with the YouTube breakdown. Um, I will also share the slides from today's class um, in the previous class that we're reviewing. AP exam has some of the FRQ practice stuff on there. And then I'll also send out, um, I believe it's uh, number eight, the Google Doc review. Um, I want to say that's on abnormal psych and clinical psych. But go ahead and share the screen with you and we'll go over the latest YouTube review. Okay, so number seven, motivation, emotion, personality. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we have the, the conversation of intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic, that's going to go a lot more with your biological perspective. Extrinsic is going to go a lot more with behavior, sociocultural. Uh, first thing they addressed was the drive reduction theory. Uh, we are motivated by our biological drives. Okay, those are also called primary drives, such as thirst and hunger. Brian's been playing video games for hours and hours and hours. Uh, he doesn't want to get up, but he's hungry. He needs a hot pocket. So he is going to get up. He is going to go to his, you know, upstairs. He is going to retrieve where that, that hot pocket is. Uh, he's going to cook it up and he's going to grab, you know, a Gatorade. And, and that was motivation, right? The thirst, hunger, primary drives that drove him to a certain behavior, right? The motivation was there. We naturally strive to maintain homeostasis, okay? We want a balanced state. We want a comfortable state, not too low, not too high. Uh, we don't want the heart rate going too much. And we also, you know, enjoy a little bit of, of increased heart rate in, in our lives. So we, we try to find some kind of balance there, homeostasis. Uh, drives our motivational state uh, that produce a depletion or a deprivation of something we need, okay? So drives are a motivational state. They drive us to certain behaviors because there is a de depletion or we are being deprived of something that we want, something that we desire. Okay. So caffeine addicts, all right. We are motivated to, to wake up and brew coffee. Um, you know, or maybe you, you wake up early because you got to go to Panera or Starbucks or something like that. Okay. We'd probably rather sleep. We like sleeping in, but we're ca caffeine addicts. And so we are motivated to certain behaviors. We are motivated to, to, to get that fix, if you will. Okay. So I got to wake up early and, and I got to brew my own coffee or I got to wake up early. So I have time to go to Panera, right? That'll satisfy the need. And that's going to relieve some of this tension. That's, that's going to, you know, again, give me that kind of fix that allows me to return to homeostasis. Uh, review here on cognitive dissonance. Remember, that is the mental stress, the, this discomfort we have mentally um, that we experience when there's a conflict between our thoughts and our behaviors. You can also think of this as like a guilty conscience. Uh, you have the angel on one shoulder, you have the, the devil on the other, okay? Um, how we rationalize certain behaviors. You know, we... We cheat on a quiz or something like that, and then we rationalize it. We know cheating on the quiz was wrong, but we rationalize that eh, everyone else was doing it. Okay, now I don't have to feel as bad about myself. Uh, I cheated on the quiz, but you know what? I had to work a, a late shift last night, and then I did a really good job helping my younger sister with her homework, and so I rationalized it. Okay, we we know our behavior was wrong. We know it goes against what we we know it to be correct or moral or ethical. And it creates a little bit of, of tension, a little bit of, uh, again, guilty conscience, you know, maybe regret. And so we have this cognitive dissonance. We're often motivated to decrease that cognitive dissonance, whether, you know, maybe that motivates us into a confession. Maybe that, that motivates us into profusely apologizing for something. Maybe that motivates us into not really taking responsibility, but we go out of our way to, to do an extra nice task. Okay. And, it, and then it kind of, it, it helps us again, mentally, it helps us recover from that cognitive dissonance. Um, all right. So going into motivation, we have the incentive theory. We are motivated by stuff that we like. We are motivated by reinforcement. It could be extrinsic motivation. It could be intrinsic motivation. We're motivated by positive reinforcement. Okay. So, you, again, you think about like, um, you know, B.F. Skinner and Thorndike, you know, they had the cats and they had the lab rats. And, it, you know, those animals, you know, through operant conditioning, they, they were craving positive reinforcement, you know, whether it be a food pellet or a chunk of cheese. Uh, Thorndike had those cats going through the mazes trying to get that that fresh piece of fish on the other side. So we are motivated by stuff that we like, you, you know, incentives go a long way. Think about pretty much any time you complete an assignment, you're doing that because you're incentivized through points, you know, through a good grade, through a class rank. 
Uh, you know, some of you guys might have taken an ACT, SAT prep course. You are incentivized by having a higher SAT score. Some of you guys always show up to work on time and, and always do exactly what you're supposed to do at work because you're incentivized by that, that hourly wage or, or hopes that you get a promotion or a, a pay bump. The over justification effect, we went over that today in class, but intrinsic motivation decreases as extrinsic motivation is used. Okay, so intrinsic motivation, that's what's inside of us, um, motivating us to, to do certain behaviors. Okay, so again, I, I'm studying for for uh, this upcoming test because I want to do good. I want to be the best version of myself. I know that I'm supposed to work hard. And so I'm motivated by that fulfillment. Okay. I'm not motivated by, by money. I'm not motivated by a reputation. I'm motivated by being the best version of myself. Okay. So having that intrinsic motivation is really, really good. But if you always have rewards, if, if you always have extrinsic motivation playing a role, then your intrinsic motivation will lower. Okay, so if I'm always motivated by money, by extra credit, by points, um, by reputation, then my intrinsic motivation lowers. Okay, and we talked about that in class today about how, you know, if I told you ahead of time, hey, I need you to do this, this big assignment, but it's not for credit, there's not going to be any points. How many of you guys would then do it, right? Now, doing that assignment is still going to help you learn. It's, it's going to be good practice for you. It, it's going to pay off in the long run as far as, you know, you know, intellectually developing. But because it's not for points, there's no extrinsic motivation there. How many of you would actually follow through with that assignment? And if you did follow through with it, how many of you would do it to the best of your ability? Probably not many of us, right? Because intrinsic motivation you know, especially in 2022, just isn't as strong for a lot of people as extrinsic is. Uh, humanism, the humanists, you know, uh, they talk about motivation through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. Uh, motivation allows us to, to get higher and higher up that hierarchy, closer and closer to the, the tip of the pyramid there, which is self-actualization, right? We are motivated to be the best version of ourselves. We are motivated to, to have a career. We are motivated to, to have relationships uh, and provide for ourselves. So intrinsic and extrinsic motivation both fit with humanism. Um, all right, let's get into the cognitive perspective and, and a little bit of motivation here. Uh, they talk about the arousal theory. Okay, we're motivated to achieve an optimal, optimum or optimal arousal level. Okay, uh, I think earlier in class we talked about Izzy running cross country. Okay, if she shows up to a cross country race and she is too aroused, she has too much arousal, you know, she's probably going to go out, you know, as soon as they start the race, she's going to come out too fast and she's going to finish real slow, okay? Or she doesn't have enough arousal. She doesn't have enough energy, and she's going to start that race too slow and probably finish too slow, and she's not going to be at the optimal level. But if she has that, that desired, if she has that optimal level of arousal where she's got energy but not too much energy, she turns into really good race time. Think about taking the AP exam or think about taking the SAT. If you show up to that test too energized, too aroused, then you're not going to be able to focus. You're not going to be able to pay attention. You're going to be too fidgety. And vice versa, if you show up not energized enough, then you're also not going to do as well as you could on that exam, okay? Um, think about, you know, uh, arousal. We like that. We like energy. We like, you know, the, the hormones and the neurotransmitters that are associated with that. And that's why when you go, get off a fun uh, ro roller coaster with Six Flags or whatever, that, when you get off that ride, what do you do? You immediately go back to the start, right? You want to write it again. Uh, adrenaline junkies seeking high risk adventure. You know, they are motivated to, to keep pursuing that, that level, that arousal level that they've grown to love. Okay. Um, but, you know, you can also think about like uh, if you did like a, I don't know, let, let's say you did uh, a weekend fitness event. Okay. Or, or uh, you had an entire, week of, of final exams and stuff like that, you're going to be motivated to seek something that brings you back to homeostasis. Okay. So, um, you know, I was saying, you know, about like, um, doing that ruck event, right. Where it, it was a lot of training and, and showing up there, you know, um, took a lot of, of energy and tried real hard and a lot of focus and stuff like that. And as soon as I was done with that event, I did not want to go 
I did not want to leave that event and, and go out and spend a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of hours out on the night and staying up late and partying and stuff like that. No, I wanted to relax. I, I wanted um, to just go get some food, go back to the hotel, watch episodes of The Office and fall asleep. And it wasn't just because I was tired or I, I was fatigued. It, it's the body wanting homeostasis. OK, so when you have a really high energy, a really high arousal level, at some point, you've got to bring that back down, not lower than homeostasis, but back to homeostasis. So let's look at, at a few of those ideas. Okay, so you have the yerkes dotson law, which too much arousal is going to lead to low performance. Too little arousal is going to lead to low performance. So what we're just talking about, we want moderate levels, uh, optimal levels. That's going to be the best performance. Um, cognitive expectations drive motivation. Do we expect that? Um, and there's three things we, whether we very consciously talk about or uh, uh, play this out in our mind or just kind of subconsciously, but your motivation is kind of driven by a few questions. Uh, will high effort increase performance. Okay. So if I put in a lot of performance or a, a lot of studying, you know, for the AP exam, will that increase my performance? The answer is probably yes. Will our performance be reinforced? So if I do really good on the AP exam, is that going to be reinforced? Yeah, you're going to get college credit. Do I value the reinforcement being offered? Do you value college credit? Do you value that it's going to save you a semester's worth of time and a semester's worth of money? You probably do. So if you can answer yes to all those, you're probably highly motivated to prepare accordingly for the AP exam. Uh, okay, so now let, let's shift to emotion here. Um, the three, we went over these in class, but the three big theories on emotion. James Lange theory, that says that a stimulus, an event is going to happen, and then we're going to have a physio physiological response, and then we're going to have an emotional response. So it happens in a step-by-step -step process. Something happens. Then our, our body kind of reacts, and then we label that emotion, okay? So let's say an earthquake takes place. There's your stimulus. An earthquake is happening. Now, that directly leads to your heart rate increasing, your heart pounding, okay? There's your physiological response. And then we're going to label that like, oh, crap, I'm scared. Is there an earthquake happening, okay? So you have your stimulus, the earthquake. You have your physiological arousal, your heart pounding, increased heart rate. And then you will label that as fear, as terror, okay? Check your singer. Remember, this is the two-factor theory. It's basically the same as, as the James Lange, but we add in a little bit more cognition, okay? So it's stimulus happens. Our response then happens. We have a cognitive evaluation or a cognitive appraisal, and then we label that emotion, okay? So the earthquake happens. That leads to the heart pounding, the heart rate increasing, which leads to some thoughts we have. Um, have I been here before? Do I recognize what this is? And then it's going to lead to, you know, some kind of, of emotional label, okay? So the earthquake happens. Here goes my heart. It's increasing. And now I'm thinking about that. OK, uh, I, I'm thinking about this situation and I can say, you know what, I've been in an earthquake before. I'm a little nervous, but I'm not I'm not scared or oh, I have no idea what's going on. I live in central Illinois. We never have earthquakes. What is this? And I label it as fear. King and Bard. Remember, the B and Bard can stand for both. Right. These are both happening simultaneously. OK, the stimulus happens you know, earthquake, and then simultaneously, our heart rate starts increasing, and we label our emotion, okay, so it's happening at the same time, here goes my heart rate, and my heart rate's going, because I'm labeling it as fear, as terror, uh, facial feedback effect, your facial expressions, smiling, frowning, laughing, that kind of stuff, that can actually help trigger your emotions, okay, so if you're frowning, if you're crying, if you've gone a long time without smiling, that could lengthen the period of feeling sad, uh, uh, feeling discomfort, if you smile, if you laugh, that can actually increase the likelihood of being happy. OK, so uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the same, but laughter is contagious. Right. Well, that means if you're around laughter, if you're laughing, you know, yourself, it increases the likelihood of you maintaining that mood, you maintaining that emotion. Uh, Paul Ekman going with facial expressions, Paul Ekman talks about how it, it's not really based on culture, that facial expressions are kind of universal. Uh, they're similar across different cultures. Stress. Cellier's general adaption syndrome. We went over this in class. Remember, that's kind of three phases. When, when you're put in a, a stressful situation, you go through these three phases, alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. Okay, So the body's response to stress goes across those three levels. 
alarm. That's quick. That's immediate. Here it is. Uh, I don't know. Again, an earthquake. It can be an earthquake. Um, Short term, intense response to that stress. This is where your fight or flight is kind of triggered. Okay. And in adrenaline, your adrenal glands are at work and adrenaline is being released. Okay. So now we get into a little bit of the the biological psych, but sympathetic nervous system is at work. The the autonomic nervous system is at work. You know, you just, you're facing a, a stressful situation. That heart rate is going, muscles are contracting, hormones are, are at play. The endocrine system is going. You have the heart rate increasing, adrenaline, uh, blood pressure, breathing is increasing, maybe even some sweat. Okay. That takes us into resistance. This is a little bit more long-term. It's less intense because it's longer, but again, it's a response to stress. Your body is resisting what is happening or your body is trying to repair what is happening. You know, you went through that incredibly um, brief earthquake and and all that, that we talked about with heart rate and and breathing, you know, all that stuff increases. Now your body is trying to repair your, your body is trying to make sense of what happened. And what is the purpose here to return to homeostasis, right? You're trying to reverse all of that stuff that just happened in the alarm. Now, if successful, you're pretty much done. You're done with that stress. You coped with it. You relieved it. If it's not successful, if you have to continue fighting that scenario, if you have to continue fighting that stressor, then you know the alarm phase basically continues. Uh, the resistance is not working. It's not successful. Those sy- symptoms will persist until resistance is complete, until you figure it out, or until you go to the third part, uh, exhaustion, right? Until that sets in. Um, you know, exhaustion, that, that's the body is no, it, 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 it's going to fail. The body is no longer able to resist the stressor. Fatigue sets in, not like just feeling, you know, tired or whatever. No, no, but your fatigue, your, your body is done. Your mind is done. So these stressors, if they endure, if they persist, if they go a long time, without relief that drains you physically that drains you emotionally that drains you mentally um i mean you're going to be reduced to the the point where the body is no longer able to cope with stress then what happens we drink too much alcohol we we start taking drugs uh we maybe have bouts of depression uh maybe you know you have to seek some kind of anxiety medication okay so if the body cannot take care of itself, if the if resistance is not successful, then you're going to experience, you know, exhaustion. And that goes across the spectrum, right? You, you can have minor exhaustion or you can have severe. And that gets back into, like I talked about, with, with drinking and drugs and medication. Prolonged levels of high stress can obviously be pretty damaging for you. I mean, that's that's going to hurt your immune system. Uh, your body is always at work. Your body is always in resistance. Your body is always trying to fight you know, different stressors, and that will really take a toll on your immune system. Um, Digestive, you know, you could incredibly lose weight here throughout, you know, these severe bouts of stress, or you could overeat uh, and you could gain a lot of weight. Uh, Cardiovascular, your heart and and sleep disturbances, uh, reproductive systems, testosterone levels and stuff like that, it can all be damaged, you know, if, if you are not successful in resistance. Uh, we talked about today in class, but remember the difference between acute stress disorder and PTSD is the duration. Acute stress disorder is not going to hit 30 days. If it hits 30 days, it is now PTSD. Uh, approach, 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 avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. I think you guys remember those, but that's that's conflict. That's stress that is brought about by you know situations. Approach, approach, having to choose between two things you really like or you really want to do. Approach, avoidance, having to choose between a thing you really want to do and a thing you don't want to do, but you know you have to do it. Something you'd like to avoid, but you got to do it. And then avoidance, avoidance. You have to choose between doing two things you don't want to do, but you know one has to be completed. Uh, personality, go back into Freud real quick, psychoanalytic, Freud with the, the id, the superego, and the ego. Remember, the id is, is instincts. It, it's primitive. It's primal. It's your desires, sex, aggression. Uh, it's mostly hidden. It, you're unconscious. Remember, the it is the pleasure principle. It tells us what we want and we want it now. Instant gratification. Superego, that's the angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other. That's us, you know, kind of conflicting between right and wrong or moral conscious. And then the ego, that mediates between the it and the superego. It's what you want versus what you should do. Remember, the ego is the reality principle. Uh, what is realistically the best decision for me now? Sure, I want to beat the crap out of this person, but realistically, is that what I should do? Is there something wrong about that? Um, when the id and the superego are not satisfied, the ego uses defense mechanisms. Okay, So 
Remember, get back into that review. Uh, denial, okay? A, a constant state of denial could be, you know, your sig significant other is cheating on you. Everybody knows it. In fact, you probably know it, but you're in denial. Why? Because it's going to crush you. It, it, you're going to have to deal with a, a circus of emotions, okay? And you don't want to feel like you aren't enough, that you're not good enough, that, that the boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, you know, wanted to move on. So you're in denial. Rationalization. Um, you know, I, uh, Brian here asked somebody to prom and that person says, nope, sorry, I don't, I'm, I don't want to go to prom with you. Well, I did. It's not like I want to go with you either. Rationalization. Okay. Repression. Uh, we, we send stuff, you know, to the deep, dark parts of our, our mind. Cause we don't want to think about it. regression. We go back to earlier stages of our life. Okay. And I think the example we used earlier was when you guys go off to college, you know, it, it, it might be too much for some of you guys. It, it might create a lot of stress for some of you guys. And so maybe you're calling your mom, your dad more than than you typically do. Uh, maybe you took a, a stuffed animal with you to decorate your, your room and you start leaning on that stuffed animal, maybe it's sleeping with it because it brings more comfort. Uh, projection. You know, it's not your fault, but I'm going to say it is your fault. Displacement, taking my anger out other places, a uh, better place, sublimation. You know, I'm really stressed instead of, um, you know, drinking too much or whatever. I, I start kickboxing, for example. Uh, free association, psychotherapy, talk therapy, dream analysis, ink bots. That's all how they try to jump into your personality. Humanists and personality. Uh, we are always pursuing self-actualization. We always want to be the best version of ourselves. Um, you know, conflict there could come between, you know, what is our ideal self versus where are we actually right now? Okay. Am I being the best that, that I can? Uh, am I slacking? Uh, am I, am I just kind of content with being mediocre? Okay. That's, that's incongruence. Now, how do we get there? And once we get there, that's congruence. Okay. Uh, we're reaching self-actualization. We're working towards our overall goal. Remember Carl Rogers was all about unconditional positive regard. Uh, that's, you know, the patient client relationship, you know, if, if someone is coming to you because they have uh, psychological issues, you know, you need to treat them with unconditional positive regard. You need to approach, you need to be very genuine. Okay. Don't approach them like some psychologist that knows everything. No, I mean, be on their level, uh, make sure that they're, excuse me, that they are very comfortable talking to you. Be positive. No matter what they say, be positive. No matter if they can find something, don't say, oh crap, you're screwed. You have a lot of issues. No, be positive. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of that. Yes, don't worry. I've seen this in other patients before. I understand, but you know, that kind of stuff, empathetic. Uh, but you're always treating them positively. You are a very active listener. When they say something, you don't just write it down. When they say something, don't just look at them like, and shake your head with an eyebrow raise. No, you give them feedback. You're an active listener. Um, kind of stop here, pretty close to here, the big five model. Uh, remember, these are personality traits. Uh, I talked to you guys about using the acronym CANOE or using the acronym OCEAN. These are measured by uh, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Okay, but remember those five traits, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. I've got some synonyms there for you guys, but openness, exactly like it sounds, conscientiousness, you know, you're, you're competent, uh, you're responsible, you, you know what, what the situation is asking for. Extroversion, you're able to make social relationships, you're, you're interested in other people, you're outgoing. Uh, agreeableness, you're, you know, you're, you're not always looking to, to argue, not, you're not always looking to be confrontational, right? You're friendly, you're optimistic, you're cooperative, you help other people. Uh, and then neuroticism, okay? Remember, that's kind of constant states of stress, anxiety, um, inflexible. It's got to be your way or it's got to be a specific way or, you know, that brings about too much stress. You don't have a lot of self-confidence. You might doubt yourself. Uh, and then mood swings, okay? Uh, Bandura and his theory of reciprocal determinism. Remember that, you, you know, you have behavior, you have personality, and you have situations, okay? Our situation you know, that we find ourselves in that can impact our personality and that can impact our behavior. Our behavior can impact our personality, which can impact situations and personality can impact situations, which can impact our behavior it goes all which way, every which way. Okay. 
Um, and then we'll end here with locus of control. Remember, locus of control is just how we address a situation, how we address fault, how we address responsibility. And it can be internal or external. Okay. So internal, we are responsible for our situation. We are responsible for our, our outcome. We make our decisions and we are responsible for those consequences for those outcomes, right? Um, if the outcome is good, well, yeah, it's because I worked hard to achieve it. If the outcome is bad, well, it's because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I, I, I didn't do uh, what I needed to do to make it a better outcome. External outcomes are determined by fate, by luck, by the, the power of other people or by the fault of other people. It wasn't us. Okay. Um, so if something doesn't go our way, you know, it, it it was it was just meant to be that way. Okay? It didn't have anything to do with how we tried or it was because somebody else was at fault. Okay, Maybe something good happened to us and we say, hey, I was just lucky. It, it just happened to work out for me. OK, so you have internal and you have external locus of control. Uh, so as stop here, we're all done as stop. Remember, um, send in the slides with you, send in another Google Doc with you then obviously this video, okay? So continue preparing for that AP exam coming up quick on Tuesday. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't leave it to just, you know, a, a big day of studying on Sunday because that's following prom. So make sure Thursday and Friday and heck, even Saturday morning, if you're getting your nails done or your hair did, make sure you're, you're spending some time reviewing there too. All right, thanks guys.